Okay, so I think we have sufficiently large audience, so probably people will be um, joining in, but I will probably start. So I'm Michael Bronstein, I'm the DeepMind Professor of Artificial Intelligence at the University of Oxford, and I'm also the Chief Scientist in Residence of uh, Vant AI, who is the sponsor for this new series of lectures on generative AI and machine learning in uh, drug discovery. So today we have the pleasure to have um, Bruno Correa, who is a professor at uh, EPFL, Ecole Polytechnique Federal de Lausanne in Switzerland. And he's an expert in protein engineering and protein design. And um, he did his uh, doctoral studies and postdoctoral studies primarily in the US. So he worked with uh, David Baker, he has been at EPFL for the past approximately eight years. And uh, we've been working with him for something like six years. So it's been quite a remarkable journey, which uh, I find probably the most rewarding and the most insightful uh, collaboration in my uh, scientific career. So uh, then I will take over from Bruno and I will also present some, some um, uh, recent results. But the main topic of this uh, talk today will be about how to harness uh, geometry and how to use geometric approaches to design new molecules and understand how proteins uh, work and interact with themselves or with small molecules. So I should also say that Bruno is on the advisory board of, of Ante AI. And um, the, 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 the spirit and the, the idea of this new lecture series is to invite people from different uh, fields, from biology, biochemistry, structural biology, from machine learning, and also from theory to present um, some of the, the uh, cutting edge approaches in this field. So I guess without further ado, Bruno, uh, I will switch to you. All right. I will focus the first 20 minutes of this lecture, which I'll share with Michael, uh, mostly just on proteins and, and the work that we've been doing. And so I'll start with just a brief introduction of what proteins are. This mostly for sort of like the, the, the machine learning and the computer science crowd and, and give you an idea of what the problem is uh, or what the problems um, are that we're, that we're typically facing when we want to engineer um, new proteins, and then give you a couple of uh, different applications that, that we've been working on in the lab and different questions that we have also to in interrogate on how far can we actually push these methods. So starting from sort of like, you know, the, the crash course in, in proteins, right, I, I bet you that many of you are aware that proteins are encoded by our genetic material. So all the proteins that are made uh, in cells or the human body, they're in fact encoded in our genome. And one of the very interesting uh, parts of it is that uh, whenever you have uh, a particular sequence of amino acids, so that's what we call these building blocks, um, which are these this, uh, small molecules that the proteins are made, so, so amino acids, which we have an alphabet of 20, um, these uh, strings of amino acids, in fact, they adopt um, a folded uh, three-dimensional structure. And essentially, this folded three-dimensional structure, or in many cases, the, these are folded structures, in some cases are disordered, uh, they then have uh, molecular functions that then translate uh, into biological functions. And I'm sure that you're also aware of the astounding progress that has done that has been done in this area of um, predicting structure from sequence, particularly with algorithms like uh, AlphaFold and RosettaFold. Now, perhaps you're not super familiar with what um, proteins can actually do, and, and proteins can pretty much do anything and everything um, that is related to biological function. So you can think about proteins as the effectors of the defense mechanisms in our body, also storage of uh, important chemicals, uh, transport across um, across membranes, uh, and signaling signaling cascades, and also so like for instance, e even for to provide um, you know hard structures in in our body such as such as collagen. But now, if you're a protein engineer essentially what you face um, is, is a problem of space and size, right? So, so let's say that you want to engineer a new protein and you have to come up with a new sequence of amino acids. And essentially what you can start seeing here on the left is basically the magnitude of the problem. So, so let's say that you want to design just a protein of 50 amino acids. We're essentially talking about um, a problem that is in the order of magnitude of the 10 to the 65th, right? So, so this is, you know, really a truly astonishing size um, of, and complexity where um, you could think about the protein of 50 amino acids as sort of like, you know, in fact, actually a, a, a very small protein where, where most of the proteins in, in nature are actually much larger than 50 amino acids. 
And now, when we're thinking about this this um, this exercise of uh, protein design, what we're really trying to do in in many cases, not in every cases, but in many cases, is really can we actually explore uh, the space of sequences which nature has not yet explored, particularly related because oftentimes you know humans have needs um, that nature didn't really have, and 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 I think you know it, it is fair to say that uh, humans these days have a lot of needs, and so so there's a lot of need also to um, to design proteins with new functions that could be useful either for uh, you know. Uh, new materials, health-related issues, new enzymes, uh, and things like that. And I'll give you a couple more examples. Now, thinking about how uh, a structure-based um, design exercise looks like, you can take a look at this uh, animation that I have here, where oftentimes the way that we do this is we define the structural space for which we want the protein to fold on, and then we try to fit the best combination of amino acids um, that is possible to, to stabilize this particular fold. So you see here the fold um, being uh, pictorially described in yellow with all the secondary structure elements, and then the sequence search happening uh, in real time, if I will, um, to, to in order to try to find the best solution. Now, here, what we're hoping for is that while we're doing this process, not only we, we want to have uh, this idea of designing proteins that do new things, but also this, this conversation of understanding the fundamental design principles, because in the same process where we're engineering these new molecules, uh, we also hope to understand what principles are important, in fact, to engineer them. So one of the things that we've been seeing throughout this example is that um, there are a number of different challenges in, in what we call the noble computational design. And, and one of the challenges is, is under this broad umbrella of how do we actually design proteins with functions. So a lot of successes have been done in the novel protein design. Now this, this, um, this slide is already a little old, but uh, you can even see that um, you know, in the last couple of years, our ability to design new structures has really been um, um, has, has really been growing exponentially, and, and we can now design things much more uh, easily and with a lot more success rates that we could do before. Now, perhaps what a problem that it still remains um, to be solved is really this idea: how can we actually design proteins that are structurally accurate, but also that are functional, so that they have some type of biological function? And again. Uh, I also should should clarify that the way that we we define the word function is also a very loose term, and uh, and functions in biology can be uh, many different things. So let me tell you a bit about uh, the two things that I want to tell you today, and this will be about how to actually use uh, geometric deep learning to design site specific protein binders, which interestingly enough has been one of these problems that um, the novel protein design has been trying to tackle for. Um, a long time, but it, it, as it turns out, due to um, to the, the the type of accuracy that we need, it's actually been um, extremely hard. And and another uh, aspect of um, our work that we've been recently exploring is how can we actually uh, expand uh, the repertoire of proteins that we can actually drug, particularly by bringing proteins from um, the membrane uh, proteome to the soluble proteome and facilitating um, facilitating, for instance. Uh, drug development strategies that were not possible before. And I'll tell you a bit about how we're going on this. So protein-protein interactions in, bio, in biotechnology, right? So you can actually design protein-protein uh, interactions to do a lot of things. And this could be either protein-based therapeutics, cell-based therapeutics, biosensors, uh, applications in synthetic biology, uh, and, and many other things. This is for sure not um, an, uh, uh, an extensive slide. Now, the way that we started thinking about this problem um, back in the day together with Michael was um, really thinking about representing molecules um, using different a different paradigm. And, and the paradigm that we wanted to use was really this type of surface-based representation. And, and I think the analogy that we, we were always having in our mind is like, look, you know, um, so we have this new class of techniques by the time that were new, right? Where uh, uh, in, in, in the realm of machine learning that were extremely good at learning patterns. And for instance, if you think about patterns that you find in images, um, you can think about the, the, the sorts of things that you can actually learn from a, peop a person's face is, is, is actually kind of incredible, right? And again, this is also from sort of like, you know, using labeled data with, uh, with an enormous amount of data. What we wanted to do was, well, can we actually learn the same types of patterns in molecules, in particularly in proteins, that could help us to engineer new molecules, right, or new proteins. 
And um, and one thing that I should um, that I should highlight is that in biology and in structural biology is not um, uh, an exception. We are always in in data scarce scenarios, and, and as such, the, the type of algorithms that one uses cannot be sort of like you know very data heavy, and they will likely have to be imprinted with with some kind of priors that allows to compensate for um, for the lack of data. And, and I think what you're going to see next is, is essentially a realization of that. So what we did by that time, and this is, is still continuous work um, under development uh, in, our, in our lab, was to create MASSIVE, which stands for Molecular Surface Interaction Fingerprints. And basically what MASSIVE did uh, very briefly was really this idea of starting um, segmenting um, protein surfaces into this data unit, which we refer as patches, and then aggregating the information of these patches uh, into um, uh, in, into learnable outcomes ultimately, and how did we do this? So we did this with the help of actually um, uh, features that made physical sense, and particularly two classes of different features, which are geometric features and chemical features. And we use geometric features because we knew that um, it is, or it has been known, not just we knew, but it has been known for for many. Uh, decades, I, I risk to say that complementarity, geometric complementarity, is a determinant of protein interactions. But also, chemical complementarity um, is uh, again another um, another determinant for um, having two molecules coming together. So, within the the realm of this framework, we we enriched our data structures with these kinds of features. We then gave it uh, a polar coordinate system, just so that we would not lose. Uh, the spatial orientation of each of the points. And then we started putting this uh, into a geometric deep learning approach to uh, basically uh, summarize this, um, uh, this, this geometric and three-dimensional information into uh, a, a numerical vector, which in this case I will refer as a fingerprint descriptor. And then these fingerprint descriptors, they can be um, trained for different functions, or sorry, for different tasks to determine a uh, function of, of protein structures. Now, that said, I won't tell you too much about that today. That has been sort of like work that we have um, published uh, for a while now. And so um, I will just tell you the last incarnation of this um, of this of this massive, which we 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 um, call massive seed. And basically, massive seed stands as a, as a pipeline for designing the noble protein protein interactions. And the way that we do this is basically by having a, a target protein where we select a site with a high propensity for protein-protein interactions, we drive uh, a surface fingerprint, and then we search the surface fingerprint against very large databases of protein fragments, which are derived from real structures. And, um, and we try to search for um, complementary motifs that, that can uh, establish a protein-protein, uh, uh, a functional protein-protein interaction. And here you can think about this, this problem as an analogy of uh, finding the right key to the lock uh, that that we have, and so and it, it looks something like this out of out of this uh, after after this step of the procedure. Once we have this procedure, then we actually start placing this um, these motifs into globular proteins, and then we go to the lab and test them. So what we one of the first cases that we that we worked on was was, was on how to design uh, the novel binders against uh, SARS-CoV-2, and so you see that here in this case we generated. Uh, we site, we designed, we, we selected the site, um, we started sort of like searching for seeds, and we engineered um, 63 designs, or we designed 63 different sequences. Um, we screened them, and I will I will sort of like go very quickly over uh, over this, or not even telling you so much about the screening process, but ultimately what, what we ended up doing was to um, uh, achieve a binder that was in fact uh, capable of neutralizing the virus. And that's the, um, the, the, the data that I'm showing you here in comparison which, which, um, uh, with a monoclonal antibody from AstraZeneca. Ultimately, we were able to confirm uh, with a real uh, cryo-EM structure of the complex of our design with the design binder that um, the, the, the quaternary complex formed by these two molecules was in fact uh, accurately predicted. Uh, in a second case, um, what we did here was to go after uh, this molecule uh, PDL1, and PDL1 has one of these very interesting features, which is uh, apparently one of the flattest um, interfaces 
um, that were surfaces that we know of in the PDB. And so it seemed like to us that this was a very interesting uh, case study to, to test if the, if the algorithm was, was only good uh, on, on proteins that have uh, very well uh, defined pockets, or if we could also sort of like target this, this type of surfaces that are harder. And again, I won't show you too much of the, of the, of the biochemical characterization, but what I will tell you, though, is that it, uh, eventually we were able, with, together with our collaborators, to solve two crystal structures of some of these designs. And so here, what you're what you're seeing is a comparison between the model that I was generating uh, using the massive pipeline and the crystal structure. And for instance, here on your left, you can see that basically uh, the complex that is formed um, is uh, essentially identical. Uh, and this is true in in in, in both cases that we um, that we were able to generate. Perhaps one of the questions that uh, that you are wondering is if, in fact, when we were designing these binders, did we discover um, some new binding modes, or if we just um, essentially recapitulate um, binding modes that were known um, in other protein-protein interactions? And, and the best that we could do in order to try to answer this question was to compare um, the protein in, the 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 protein-protein interaction between the native. Uh, binder, which in this case is PD1, and you see here PDL1 as our target, and the seed uh, that we have used in order to template a new protein-protein uh, interaction. And um, what you see here is that essentially we do not um, use uh, the same type of motif. We target the same site, but we don't use, uh, not even close, the same type of um, uh, uh, side chain interactions which, which were observed uh, in PD1. So that's sort of like, you know, one of obsession of ours is, is in fact, can we actually create uh, machine learning algorithms that gener generalize across different problems? And so we wanted to take this, uh, this conversation to, to the next level. And um, what we set out here to do, and I, I call your attention to the lower part of the slide, was basically, can we actually now design a protein-protein interaction that targets um, a surface which um, is not really made out of protein material, but is made out of a ligand material. So you see, you see what's happening here. And, and the idea is that we're, we're going to have only a protein that um, only binds in case the, the ligand uh, is present in the receptor. And I call your attention that this algorithm has never seen a small molecule uh, in its existence. So it has never seen that, it has never trained for that. So, so really here, we're trying to push it into, into understanding if our representation and the patterns that are being learned are in fact generalizable or not. And so um, this is what we started to working on in, in, in this case, test protein, where we, we had um, good structural information for uh, the ligand receptor and the ligand itself. And you can see here uh, that now, uh, and, and I will just call your attention for this um, piece of data that you see here on the top right, where once you have uh, BCL2 alone, we see no binding, but if you have BCL2 with uh, vanidoclax, you see a shift on the population showing binding, and this is also shown here uh, uh, using a more biochemical assessment. So, okay, so the conclusions for this part of the talk um, is that um, we did, in fact, come up with um, a framework where we could generate these vector fingerprints to study features of uh, protein structures. Um, eventually, uh, we had proof of concepts for the efficient and robust design of site-specific binders, uh, which comes uh, supported by uh, a lot, an extensive body of biochemical and structural characterization. Uh, these learned fingerprints also generalize beyond protein surfaces, and we are, of course, now uh, thinking about taking these experiments to uh, the protein level uh, assessment of drug ability and, and other features. Now, as the last uh, topic of my um, talk, uh, just telling you a bit about this idea of uh, generating new uh, folds or or generate or bringing folds from uh, places in cells where they're not found uh, uh, and 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 try to do that successfully. So when we looked at the the the, the protein fold landscape, we saw that in fact different protein folds um, often partition to different environments in the cell, where you have some folds that are mostly found on the cytoplasm of cells, some folds that are mostly found in, uh, in membranes and some other folds which are uh, shared. And so, so what we thought about this was like, okay, well, can we actually sort of like bring uh, membrane folds into the soluble uh, realm? 
And to do so, we actually took advantage of um, uh, a protocol that was developed in our lab by, by Casper, which uh, relied on the ability of uh, AlphaFold uh, as a, a, a design template generator. And then again, with another technique from the Baker lab using, uh, using protein MPNN to, to optimize the sequences. And we wanted to test if this was actually uh, possible to do. And so we took three different membrane proteins, some of them, one of them being GPCR, Claudins, uh, rhomboid proteases, and we started sort of like designing them. Can we actually make them? So one of the things that we that we learned uh, very earlier on is that we could in fact generate sequences uh, which were completely new in um, in nature. So so not necessarily something that um, that nature had seen before, um, and that were uh, also uh, very well and successfully predicted uh, back by by alpha folds. And then again, I'll show you some experiments. And what we saw there was that um, you know some of these proteins were in fact e extremely good in, in terms of expressing in the lab the type of biochemical profile that they had um, in terms of oligomerization. So they were monomers in solution, very stable according uh, circular dichroism. And ultimately, we were able to to predict uh, one of these. Um, um, let me see if I can play this. We were able to solve the structure of one of these designs. And, and what you can see here is that the accuracy between the X-ray structure that we solved and the design model that we have predicted in the computer is again, extremely close, right? So sort of like something like that 2.67 instruments. But ultimately, you know, this was a, this were again, sort of like proteins that were extremely boring because they, they basically just, you know, did what they were supposed to do, folded to the structure that we wanted, but they really were kind of like, they had no intent of having any biological function. So, so Lars and Nico started working uh, on that. And essentially one of the things that they started by doing was, well, can we actually sort of like graft back into these soluble analogs? Uh, one, of the, one of the loops that is fine in, 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 in one of these native GPCRs, and can we actually recognize it uh, with an antibody? And so, and that's, that's, the type of, um, that's the type of experiment that you see here, where we're now having um, very good bind of these uh, of these soluble analogs to to antibodies that before used to bond um, to to membrane proteins. Okay, so with this, uh, I will uh, close up here and just giving you a few overviews about uh, what um, this uh, this what we've learned throughout this study is that we, we can in fact uh, design membrane folds very efficiently to to exist in a soluble space, and that we're currently interested in exploring the functionalization of of such of such scaffolds, right? So now I think, you know, one of the interesting things to think about is also how many things are there for us to do using sort of like uh, machine learning driven design and particularly with applications in, in biotechnology. And, and there's just so many um, different things, you know, in between viral inhibitors and switchable antibodies, uh, small molecule sensors on how we can actually put this, uh, this kinds of switchable components in living cells to make living drugs uh, we, where, where you see some examples that we have also used this uh, in the lab. So a lot of exciting things to do. And so with this, uh, you know, just uh, a big thank you for the, to the people that actually do the work, uh, which I am very lucky to work with a super team here in Lausanne and, and, and really they're, they're, they're sort of like, they're the source of inspiration of, of all the work and how much passion they bring um, into the whole conversation really makes a difference. So, so I've been very lucky in that realm, and also a big thank you to the funding agencies that have that have supported our research throughout the years. That's it. Sorry if I go if I went over time. No, that was great, and I think we're gonna intersperse with some of the questions uh, for you section uh, first, Bruno. So I'm just gonna repeat them so the audience can. Uh, can hear it and also we have it properly in the recording so uh the first question was the massive technique is quite useful for designing ppi blocking designs here you design by a fragment based approach on which you design your scaffold have you used massive to identify binding sites for de novo generated scaffolds or binders ah, mm -hmm. we have not used it yet. So in fact, you know, really the only task that we, the only two tasks that we've used it was the ones that I, that I, that I point, that I explained to you in, in the work, but I guess it depends also exactly which, which, which task you're, you're talking about, right? So, because I guess here you're talking about, well, can we actually see if some other de novo design molecules 
have some kind of binding sites that could be targeted or something like that. Um, which it's a fun question. We have never we have never really looked into it actually. Perfect. And then another question: What are the properties of the surface of massive? How does finger the fingerprint behave with slight mo uh, deviations of the surface, angstrom level deformations, etc.? Uh, very good. So yeah. So I guess you know to to this uh, to this question early on we did sort of like some type of ablation studies where we were trying to understand what was actually the um, uh, the influence of the chemical features and the influence of the geometrical features. We saw that a lot of uh, a lot of the information already was coming from geometry. The chemistry would help and did help, but a lot of the information was really coming from the geometrical features, which which was kind of interesting. And I, we think that it's probably still possible to make it um, to make it lighter in terms of features. Uh, and, and then in in later work, we actually did that. Now to the point of um, to the point of noise or perturbation of the initial structures. Um, so I guess it depends on the task. Sometimes it is very resilient to that type of noise, and in sometimes it is not super resilient. So I think there's certainly some work to be done in in terms of how we're training this algorithm because right now we really just use sort of like crystal structures. But I think it's possible also to augment um, the type of data that is being inputted so that it becomes a bit more robust. Let's put it this way. Well, then maybe one last one before we switch. Um, have you tried turning a soluble protein to a membrane protein? Well, no, but I've been thinking about it a lot. And I can tell you, so there's two answers to that question, right? Do you want it to do it in a very chemical physics, sorry, in a, in a very chemical controlled or in vitro environment? I guess it's the best word. If you want to do it in a very in vitro environment, I have to say that oftentimes you see something that is that is a little bit disappointing, right? You know, because it almost it all it's almost only needed to just put a bunch of hydrophobics in the surface, and you get things to sort of like you know to, to be present in the membrane. Now, perhaps the question that interests me more is maybe how can we actually make these designs to go to the membrane in, in a living cell? I think there there's probably a, a different set of rules that that we're not sort of like super familiar with, and I think it would be interesting to test. Perfect. And uh, the last question is, how does Massive compare to diffusion models, which I think is a perfect segue to Michael's section. So that is going to be addressed in detail. Yep. <clears throat> Thanks, Bruno. That was that was cool. So I will take over from here and I would like to talk about some follow-up work that we did on Massive. And well, I'm a computer scientist, so I will probably be talking less about uh, biological functions of proteins, but more on how we actually represent them uh, for machine learning uh, systems to be able to digest them and what can we do next. So just to remind you briefly what Massif was about. So it modeled a protein as a surface, then extracted uh, geodesic circle patches around uh, every point. And then in these patches, we did something similar to the convolutional neural networks. And then basically that there was some logic, or some part of the neural network that was task specific that allowed to solve different problems like the, for example, identifying the, the binding sites or maybe uh, predicting features that uh, allow to, to to tell whether two proteins will bind. So this part, essentially, if you look at it from differential geometric standpoint, it was um, an attempt to do uh, already early on, so about almost 10 years ago, to do something similar to convolutional neural networks on non-Euclidean domains. So you can see an illustration here, how a filter designed intrinsically on a surface uh, basically inherits all the deformations that the surface can undergo. And that, that was essentially our starting point collaboration with Bruno. So I was working with my students on these kind of architectures we call geodesic convolutional neural networks. And he came with the problems of, uh, let's try to apply it to proteins to see whether we can tell uh, how they bind. So that was that was the main idea. But the problem of uh, Massive, at least in this formulation, was that we represented proteins as triangulated mesh surfaces that were pre-computed. And we also had to pre-compute the page operators and the chemical and geometric features. 
So uh, you can, of course, do it. So it takes some time and it also requires a substantial amount of memory. But if you want to design a protein, you need something that you could, ideally you want to change your input and the output features, right? And the, the resulting descriptors will change as well. So that is not possible in this kind of, in this kind of representation. And then of course, the, the, the question I think that was asked, what happens when the protein uh, conformation slightly changes? So it could be as a result of noise, so experimental structures, but it could be something that is, is actually desired in a sense that when proteins come together, they interact, so they uh, they can assume different conformations, what is called uh, hollow conformation, super conformation. So this is addressed only to some extent uh, with, with this method. So we wanted to move from these deficiencies and uh, design a new uh, version of massive that we call differentiable massive or demassive for short. And if we start with the protein uh, that is in this case represented as um, as an atomic point cloud or, or a molecular graph, basically the idea of massive was to represent uh, the protein as uh, a surface that is uh, discretized as a mesh. So this is the, the, the water accessible surface. And then locally around each point construct kind of local approximation of the exponential lamp. So a, a geodesic patch with local system of coordinates. So specifically polar coordinates, so we can measure the geodesic distance to the shortest path on this non-Euclidean surface from, from the center of the patch. And then an angular coordinate with respect to some reference axis. So in principle, at least in theory, there is rotational ambiguity. So that's the, the structure group of this manifold. And you can design filters that would be equivalent with respect to these uh, these transformations. So it, that was beautiful line of works of Taco Coin and Max Welling. In practice, though, you can just fix some axis uh, in a repeatable way. So we use, for example, principal curvature directions, and then in follow-up works, we could also uh, use uh, the intrinsic gradient of some uh, some intrinsic function. So essentially, you compute some function on the on this manifold. Uh, that is intrinsic, so it's invariant to differentiations. You differentiate it, and that serves as a kind of uh, reference field with respect to which you count your your angles. So that was massive, but of course it requires the computation of the mesh, which, as I mentioned, is undesirable. So we wanted to steer away from it, and instead of considering the surface as a mesh, we wanted to consider it as a sufficiently dense oriented point cloud. So, and this is what you see here. So at every point uh, in this sampling of the surface, you also have normals. So if the cloud is dense enough, then you have a, in a different way all the information about the geometry of this surface. And there we can construct local reference frames and again have an analogy of patches. So the way that it works, you can measure the, the distance functions from, uh, from the atomic cloud and compute its level set at certain radius. So typically that's the size of the water molecule. Then you sample this level set and clean up. So things like what is shown here, for example, uh, points inside uh, inside the, the, the protein should be removed. And then you subsample it and compute the normals. So you get this kind of representation. And this is just a two-dimensional two visualization of, of, of what is happening. Now, the next thing is you need somehow to compute uh, geodesic distances, right? So that would be the distance that is shown in red here between these two points. And we don't really have a good way uh, that is not computationally expensive to compute distances on point clouds. So the idea that that we came up, so that was the work of uh, Freyer Sverison, uh, our joint student with Bruno, that defended actually exactly a week ago, and Jean Fidi, who is now a faculty at NVIDIA, and he was a postdoc in my group at that time. So we want to approximate the geodesic distances using what the construction that we call quasi-geodesics, and the idea is here, you want to compute a Euclidean distance between these points, I and J, and then uh, account for the curvature. So if you look at the normals at the points, so if normals point in the same direction, then you're flat, right, at least locally. And then this term, the correction term, will be uh, will will not change the distance at all, right? So it will be one. But if the normals point in different directions, right, when you have curvature, then uh, you need to increase the distance because on a curved surface, the distance will be longer than the, short, uh, the shortest line. And that's exactly what happens here, right? So this uh, inner product of the normals will be smaller than one, and then the, the, the multiplicative factor will be bigger than one. So then we use a local system of coordinates. So we have the normal, then we need to construct two other orthogonal vectors. So there is again rotational ambiguity, which we fix by uh, pointing one of the vectors 
in some fixed direction. So typically in, in intrinsic gradient of or some, some intrinsic function. And then the second one uh, is orthogonal to it. So we have this system of coordinates of unit vectors n, u, and v. And in this, this system of coordinates, we can construct now uh, basically our, our pitch operators. And this is how geodesic convolution looks like. So, uh, and this this visualization also shows you the, the color the colors represent here the, the values of the filter. So basically, we can uh, we can take features from the from the uh, this uh, surface represented as a point cloud and work with them locally in this in this representation. Now, if you compare it to the original massive, so the heavy part of massive was the pre-computation. So this is what is shown with the dotted arrows. So when you start with the atomic point cloud, extracting the surface mesh cost about six seconds, typically for a protein, then computing the features about 20 seconds, and then computing the patches about uh, about 50 seconds as well. So it's more than a minute to just pre-process a protein. And then, of course, once you have this pre-computed, then the, 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 the inference itself is very fast. So it's about 160 milliseconds. So with the massive, we don't uh, need any pre-computation. And you see that it's significantly sped up. So now the the representation is slightly different. So we first compute the, the surface point cloud with the normals, the features, the local coordinates, and then the output. And the speed up is between uh, two to three orders of magnitude. And it's all done on the fly, uh, thanks to, to uh, a library that, that Jean developed called KEOPS, standing for kernel operations. And what is probably the most important is that this pipeline is fully differentiable. So in principle, I can change my input atomic point cloud and know how the, the output will change, right? So I can back propagate through this uh, through this entire pipeline, and this is important when we want to to, to generate to design uh, new proteins. So this is just a comparison in terms of the the computational time. So this is where massive stands. So the horizontal axis is forward pass time per protein again on average. So this is about 150 milliseconds. With D massive, we are below 20 milliseconds. Now, the vertical axis represents the accuracy. So in this case of the site prediction, the binding site prediction. So this is one of the simple tasks, basically binary classification that, that allows us to test that we are not uh, throwing away, we are not compromising the, the performance of this model by doing more efficient uh, computations. And you can see that here, so the, the, the accuracy of binding site prediction is still around 85%. So we're... Uh, more than an order of magnitude faster, but uh, still the same accuracy. So the second plot here shows the memory uh, usage, the, the memory footprint. And again, in massive, because of the pre-computed patches, it is pretty heavy in terms of the, the, the memory that it uses. The massive does everything on the fly. So it is much more memory efficient. And also what I mentioned, so one of the deficiencies that we, we relied on pre-computed features, as Bruno, uh, as Bruno said, so we, we also did some ablation studies, what matters more, uh, whether it's geometric or chemical features, we actually show that you can learn them from the, uh, from the original point cloud. So here's an example of learned features that, that, uh, that approximate the, the ground truth, in this case, the, the Poisson-Boltzmann electrostatic potential, which uh, appeared to be one of the... <clears throat> chemical features we use we use we use with massive and um so this was this was the, the the sped up pipeline of course the problem that still remains is uh what happens when you change the conformation of the protein and somehow at least for myself when when i i think of proteins i think of them as a kind of three dimensional puzzles right so this is a plastic model that i think nicely visualizes this concept so you have proteins that interact and surfaces kind of abstract out all the complications of the of the fold, right? So when proteins interact, what really matters mostly is the, the, the external surface. So you can think of it as this kind of co complicated non-Euclidean uh, uh, shaped uh, uh, structures that you fit together and, and they bind. But this is, of course, visual thinking in practice when proteins interact, this is how it looks. So this is a result of uh, presence of, uh, of a ligand that changes the conformation of the protein dramatically. And we call the unbound states uh, upper conformations and the bound states hollow conformations. And here you see, so the, the pink here represents a small molecule and the protein switches from this conformation to this conformation because of the presence of the molecule. Probably its charges push aside the, the different protein structures. 
So this is something that ideally we would like to uh, would like to understand how proteins change their conformation in the presence of ligands. And basically, what we want to do is to be able to model this distribution of the the uh, the color structures given the upper structures, right? So we would like to be able to sample from this distribution. And here you can see an example again: the color structure in green and the upper structure in uh, in pink, and the blue uh, are all the different possible samples from this distribution. Now, being able to sample from distribution sounds like generative models. And let me talk about diffusion models that now have become popular in machine learning. So generative models, if you never use them or never heard about them, this is what powers applications like, for example, mid-journey or stable diffusion or DALI. So in this case, it's conditioned on a text prompt and allows you to generate images. Like if I ask for a painting of an astronaut riding a dog on the moon, you will get actually an image that is sampled from some distribution that is modeled with this diffusion model. And you can, of course, apply it also to, to molecules. So there are many applications of diffusion models. So this is from our own paper. Here we have a, a condition uh, uh, diffusion model that generates a small molecule that fits into, uh, into a pocket on the target protein. And you can see that it starts with completely noisy set of atoms, and then the uh, gradually assume the, the, the shape of probably a valid molecule that will bind into this pocket. So generative models are essentially about being able to model the distribution of data that when we work in high dimensions, it's totally impossible to, to model with other, with other means. So the idea of uh, diffusion models is that you start with your data and you apply some uh, noising process to it. So you diffuse it and then after some time it becomes, uh, becomes simply noise. So the interesting part is that you, you can actually invert the noise. So the reverse diffusion does denoising, and it seems like an impossible task. But actually, if you look at the little incremental steps uh, of of denoising, you can you can try to reverse uh, to reverse these steps in a rigorous way. And uh, so this is an illustration from the the, the paper of Song, uh, the, from Stanford, from the group of uh, Sergio Ramon. And uh, they write it nicely that creating noise from data is easy. Creating data from noise is generative modeling. So that's exactly what diffusion models uh, diff diffusion models do. So more formally, basically, what we have here in the forward process is uh, you can model it as stochastic differential equation that is given here. So the, the, the second term that contains the, the a Wiener process or so Brownian motion, uh, it's called the diffusion. And then the first term is called the drift. So basically, you can you can uh, increase the amount of noise and you can also change your 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 distribution so together it takes uh, so the here the, the the functions alpha and beta depend on time and they are chosen in such a way that you start at time zero with uh, with your data distribution and you end up with a, a normal distribution with with um, zero mean and and unit covariance so the remarkable part of it is actually the the reverse direction the reverse diffusion uh, is also a diffusion uh, it's also a stochastic differential equation that looks like this. So it's a diffusion process that looks slightly differently. So W bar here is also a Wiener process where the time is reversed. And the, the gradient of the log of probability is called the score. And usually we don't know how to compute it, but we can approximate it with a parametric function with a neural network. And this is what is called uh, the, uh, the, the, the score function. So different from terminology, I think, in, in chemistry. Uh, there, there is a term scoring function, so this is different from scoring function. So this is completely, completely unrelated. So this is one way of of computing it. So uh, you can compute, uh, in some cases, the forward transition kernel of the diffusion equation in closed form, Gaussian with some some mean invariance, and then you try to find the parameters in this uh, in this function as uh, st as theta, such that that it fits this. Uh, uh, the, these scores, and now we have basically you have this this function that allows you to to reverse the diffusion. So you can start with uh, sampling the, the the noise, which is easy, and then uh, running the, the diffusion equation backwards allows you to to produce samples from the data. I should also say that you can use uh, I can use this score function also to solve an ordinary differential equation that is shown here in white. So this is called uh, probability flow, and this is another class of approaches that can also be used to, to, to generate data from, from arbitrary distributions. 
So back to our problem. Basically, what we wanted is to be able to sample uh, uh, these bound conformations to see how proteins uh, change their conformation as a result as a result of uh, presence of uh, fligans. We obviously know that it's not arbitrary change, right? So we want to, to be able to model it. And here we can also condition on the uh, sequence of amino acids. So the whole and the upper conformations are, in this case, modeled as uh, point clouds that are aligned. So we have a matrix of size n by 3. And amino acid sequences are modeled as uh, also as arrays where we encode every, every amino acid type. What is also important about this problem is uh, uh, is uh, invariance with respect to rigid transformations. So because everything is aligned, so if I change in the same way, rotate and translate by the matrix R and translation vector T, both conformations, the probability must remain the same, right? So we have some, we basically, we reduce some degrees of freedom in, uh, in this model. And this is important because we don't care about how the proteins are positioned, uh, positioned in space. So the diffusion model that we use here, so uh, uh, we condition on the conformation uh, of the uh, on the APO conformation and the um, the sequence, which we represent using uh, uh, ESM embedding, and then the predictions uh, try to to produce the coordinates of the of the whole conformation, and the score network that we use here uh, is a combination of two blocks, so the EVO former that, that Bruno also mentioned from. Uh, uh, from DeepMind's AlphaFold 2 that takes as input the uh, residue level features that are denoted here by R and pairwise features denoted by P and produces uh, basically uh, a different set of representations that together with uh, a representation of time, so we use time embedding, are fed into this new model that we call SIEGNN. And SIEGNN is the score informed equivariant uh, graph neural network. So uh, it takes as input the hollow and the, the upper structures, as well as the residue and the pair uh, features, as well as time. And it produces, each layer produces an update to, to these features. So here is a, a schematic representation of uh, what kind of information uh, is uh, used to update the features of every node. So the node I here receives information from uh, its neighbors, J. So the, uh, the, the, the information contains uh, geometric coordinates that are denoted here by green x that need to be treated in a way that would be uh, would respect the, 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 the rigid transformations so so to be equivalent with respect to the e3 group and the uh, the r part that is shown in uh, in gray here so these are some other types of features that do not need to respect these uh, uh, these kind of transformations we also have pairwise features and we also have the global kind of feature which is the the, 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 the upper structure. So the, it's a standard message passing architecture, equivalent architecture. So the messages are computed just as a function that applied to, to, to these features. So we use the distance between the, the, the coordinates. So this makes the, the, the architecture equivalent. We also update the Rs. And then the, the, the special thing, and why the, that's why it's called score informed equivalent GNN, because here we also add uh, the, the score uh, of the diffusion model. And uh, this is what, uh, what appeared in the previous slide, where uh, uh, the, the uh, SIEGNN is used in the, in the diffusion process. So bottom line, when all these are combined, this is how the diffusion works. So you see the, in green the, the conditioning structure, so the, the, the upper conformation and then the, the predicted structure, the, the whole structure is shown in, in, in pink here. So it starts again with noise. And as you reverse the, the diffusion process, it falls into this, this, kind of, uh, this kind of configuration. And here are some uh, additional examples of uh, how we can sample the, the, the hollow conformations from, uh, from this model. So it, it works well, and basically it allows to address this problem of uh, what to do with conformational changes with proteins, which is a difficult problem in many situations because proteins are not, not rigid, they, they, they are flexible. So another diffusion model, we wanted to, uh, to make it to take a step further, the, the massive architecture. And this was actually the last work of uh, Freyer that, that uh, was part of his PhD and also that he did together with the, the Vante AI team uh, when, during his internship. 
So that was uh, that that was a big effort. So basically, we use here the uh, the D massive model to represent proteins as as surfaces with uh, with uh, as um, uh, oriented point clouds together with their features that they're uh, encoded and then uh, decoded to predict the pose of uh, one protein with respect to another. So here we are trying to solve the the docking problem. So how to align two proteins such that they bind together. So as uh, an auxiliary task that we use here, we also predict the, uh, the the interface between these proteins. So that's the the the, the points where they where, where the two proteins touch, where they, they bind, and uh, the use of this interface uh, assists in the in the prediction of the of the pose with, of one protein with respect to each other. And again, here you can see an example of how this uh, this model works. So these uh, these are the the transformations that are applied to this. Uh, uh, bright uh, blue protein with respect to the to, to the to the dark blue protein and you see that that the, the pose is predicted predicted quite well so we compare here to uh, two state of the art models so the state of the art model is divdoc uh, pp so divdoc was the work from uh, the group of regina Brasilei at mit uh, initially for uh, docking small molecules to, to proteins and divdoc pp is a version for uh, protein to protein uh, docking. So every point on this plot represents the uh, dock Q score. So the higher the score, the better is the quality of the docking. And uh, basically, for the same pair of proteins, we plot the, the dock Q score for our model on the x axis and uh, another model on the y axis. And also, we plot the, the histograms. So the, you can see that, uh, that, that uh, for example, if we compare to, uh, to AlphaFold to uh, Multimer, uh, it produces very low, uh, uh, very low uh, docu scores, so it is more or less use useless. Uh, Div doc PP uh, works better, but you can see that that uh, uh, the massive produces significantly significantly better results. And um, this is actually a new benchmark that we'll be announcing uh, in a few weeks from now. And uh, to my knowledge, at least currently. This is state of the art performance on, uh, on, on protein looking. So, here are some examples. You can see the, the two proteins that we try to dock together. So, uh, the, the, these are their structures and their molecular surfaces. And in green, you see also the predicted interface. So, uh, you can see the ground truth, how the proteins uh, actually appear together. And this is the docking that uh, DIF Massive produces. So, the, the, the dock Q score here is about uh, 0, 8, uh, 0, 0.8. In the case of DivDoc, it fails completely to, to produce correct pose. So the, the, the doc queue is about uh, 0 0.15. And here are some other examples. So here, uh, DivDoc PP is slightly more successful, but still uh, less, uh, still worse than, than Div Massive. And here is another, of, uh, another example of another, another pair of proteins and another pose. So this was about the diffusion models for. Uh, uh, for dealing with proteins, uh, in the remaining time, I would like to mention briefly uh, how we can also design small molecules with diffusion models. And in particular, I would like to talk about our recent collaboration with Bruno on fragment-based molecular design. And uh, when you design drugs, you typically know the target protein, you know its structure, so it's called structure-based uh, drug design. And you try to find a small molecule that will fit typically into some pocket of the protein and will uh, will stick to it, right? So it will it will bind to the protein and will will have some biological function that that is associated with the, the disease that you are trying to cure. And of course, the space, as Bruno mentioned, the space of molecules uh, is immense. So you need uh, to to at least uh, come up with good candidates computationally. And often you uh, it is easy to start with small fragments that are called pharmacophores that you know that that they fit into into these pockets. And then uh, connect them together, or maybe uh, when you have some some good guesses, you can also replace the, the, the overall scaffold of, of this of this compound. And uh, this is actually what Vant is doing in molecular glues. Typically, you have molecules that bind to two proteins at the same time. So you have one end of the of the compound that binds, for example, to E3 ligase. So it's an enzyme that degrades a protein by ubiquinating it, and then the cell basically kills uh, the target. And uh, here you can see that it consists of two parts. So the, the one part that binds uh, the, the, the E3 
ligase. That's, I think, to my knowledge, at least most of the molecular glues, if not all molecular glues, this part uh, looks like uh, thalidomide. So this was this unfortunate drug that was uh, prescribed to, to pregnant women and it caused, caused birth defects. So the reason why uh, it caused birth defects was uh, that it acted as, as a molecular glue. So it was discovered serendipitously to, to, have this, to have this function. And then there is another part that binds to the target and there is some flexible uh, linker between them. So that, that's the kind of things that we would like to design. And here are some examples of, of uh, molecules that look like this. So you can think of it as a form of molecular in painting. So we start with fragments that typically we know where they are placed uh, in space. So we have, they have known fixed orientation with respect to the, to the target pocket. But then we don't know how to link them. So the size of the linker can be variable, the number of atoms. We, we don't know them a priori. We don't know where they attach to the to the to these fragment force, to these fragments. We also don't necessarily know the number of fragments. So it can be two, it can be three. So that depends on what kind of drug we are designing. And we also, of course, want to avoid clashes with protein pockets. So we need also to condition all this process on the on the geometry of the of, of the entire system. So again, here we can use a diffusion model. So we start, so it's conditioned diffusion model. We start with the, the known uh, uh, pharmacophores that are shown here, highlighted in yellow and potentially also the, the geometry of the pocket. And then we uh, start with noise, basically some random configuration of points in, in space uh, that, that represent the, the, the positions of the atoms of the compound that we are generating. And then gradually as we denoise, we hope that it produces uh, a, a configuration that, that links these uh, small fragments together. So here we use a standard equivariant GNN, so allow me to go faster through it because we already seen it in the, in the previous model. So here again, we have uh, for every node in the graph, right, for every atom, we have uh, the features of the geometric type that are here represented by R. So these are the, the three-dimensional coordinates of the, of the atoms and uh, categorical features. So the atom type represented by H. And then we do the updates in a way that we uh, do not want to touch the uh, the coordinates of the uh, of the pharmacophores. So basically, we uh, we ignore the updates here. And uh, overall, the model is pretty flexible. So we call it uh, diff linker. So we can control the linker size. So we can also uh, produce it basically by sampling from some distribution. We can account for different contexts, whether it's uh, the, the atoms of the fragments or also uh, the, the atoms of the pocket. And uh, the way that we ensure that this is equivalent, we uh, use the center of mass of the, 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 of the anchors and the, and the fragments. And here you can see some examples of the uh, linkers that are generated, in this case for, uh, for two pharmacophores. And we also compare them to, to other methods uh, that were developed for, for this problem. And we are looking at different criteria that, that tell whether this molecule is likely to be, to be a drug like quantity like QED or SA, synthetic accessibility, number of rings. So typically chemists like uh, rings in, in molecules and also how many of these molecules are valid. So it compares overall favorably with, uh, with existing methods while uh, being much more flexible. And here's an example of linking multiple fragments. And you can see that, that I think these molecules mostly make sense. We can we also look at the, the how they uh, taking into account the information of the pocket matters and uh, basically we show that that without conditioning we uh, produce uh, molecules that uh, that make less sense so they, 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 they using the, the information on the pocket uh, actually helps producing producing good molecules. So I think I'm at time, so I would like to, to, to finish here with uh, some conclusions. So basically these methods of uh, geometric deep learning, or at least broadly related to this field, I think it's a powerful tool that can be applied to different problems in molecular modeling. So we've seen problems related to, to proteins, uh, predicting protein interaction, building new proteins, but also small molecules. And the key concepts here are uh, invariance and symmetry, which are basically what underpins geometric deep learning, as well as working with manifolds. So manifolds, whether these are surfaces that represent molecular, molecular structures, but also manifolds in, in, in more abstract sense. So uh, algebraic varieties and 
and uh, many folds of matrices that represent, for example, groups of transformations so that we can we can uh, uh, apply to our to our objects. And um, geometrically constrained diffusion models, I think we are just scratching the, the, the surface, so they are very powerful, and we can probably stretch significantly what we can currently do with uh, molecular generation, different flavors of, of these problems. So I think what is really needed is experimental validation because uh, uh, of course we can produce nice figures and publish papers in machine learning conferences, but the, the, the ultimate uh, uh, proof that, that these methods are valuable is to produce these molecules and test them in the lab. So I will stop here. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Maybe just one thing that I would like to mention is that you can take it beyond to um, to applications, uh, uh, not only uh, predicting the structure of the molecule, but also synthesizing the, uh, a reaction that that uh, produces this molecule. And this is an example of also recent work with Bruno uh, uh, and uh, collaborators from Microsoft Research, where we uh, basically we solve a problem that is called retrosynthesis. So when you know the compound and you try to come up with reactant with compounds that, that when they reacted together will produce this this compound but uh, again it's not the first attempt to to, to do retrosynthesis but with uh, diffusion models I think this is this is something that is new but I'm out of time so I will stop here and will be happy to answer any questions perfect amazing so let's maybe grab two or three given uh the time is quite advanced already um so the first one you know there were both models presented that used sort of typical llm uh trained representations to represent the proteins but you know you also talked a lot about um uh, geodesic convolutions what fits best in which application and you know how do you choose between the two and how do you combine them well, so it's a good question. So uh, in principle, sequence contain information about structure, right? So we know that, that uh, again, in some situations, we can uh, generate uh, the, the structure from, from sequence. So this is a hard problem. And in many cases, it also requires uh, uh, multiple sequence alignment. So this is what, for example, AlphaFold does. Uh, to make the problem simpler, I think if you have structure, you, you can go through structure and it offers kind of uh, simpler way of dealing with problems uh, that, that 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 you can call geometric right so for example how proteins bind so we actually have a, a recent paper that also with Vant that um where we show how to use uh, sequence and structure uh, together and uh, you can basically in one model you can solve problems like forward or inverse problem or conditional design of proteins for example when you have uh, when you have some additional constraints so i think both are available and uh, both have advantages and disadvantages. Perfect. And maybe one more. Um, so how do you reconcile the requirements of having methods that you can use for fast, high throughput screening, but still can capture, you know, the uh, sort of quantum mechanic level of detail that you need for, you know, property predictions and these kind of things? Good question. So we completely abstract out the quantum mechanics from these models. So um, I guess we don't model uh, quantum mechanics at all. So uh, it is, of course, uh, some kind of uh, abstraction or some kind of simplification what we do here. So we treat uh, treat molecules as basically geometric blobs. Uh, in some cases, that might be too naive and too simplified. Uh, simplified the presentation, and uh, we we need to go to 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 the basically to the to, to the basics, which is of course much more much more expensive. However, I think if it works in other cases, or let's say in some cases or in majority of cases, uh, this is already good. Perfect. And then maybe one last one, uh, more technical one. Is there a reason you chose EGNN-based architectures for the molecular diffusion models over geometric GNN architectures? Yeah, so I don't think, again, that they're uh, exclusive. So as as I showed uh, in the in my presentation, so uh, for example, the diffusion models, the, the, the score functions that we use, uh, it is based on, uh, on uh, craft neural networks. So uh, it is an ingredient. I think now I could probably say a standard ingredient, especially the, the equivariant uh, sorts of 
uh, uh, sorts of graph neural networks in diffusion models. So basically, diffusion is, uh, you can think of it as, as a process that uses graph neural networks uh, internally. So it's not either a graph neural network or a diffusion model. So it's both. Perfect. I think, uh, yeah, given the advancement of time, we'll probably uh, cut it here with the questions. There's there's a bunch more, but uh, we have a lot of additional series here. And uh, you can also ask any sort of questions on, on Twitter, um, and we'll be happy to answer them as well. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Perfect. Thanks, everybody.